In 1965, the, uh, the Oceanographic Survey Unit got assigned uh, the duty of flying, providing a crew with a special project in Vietnam, providing TV to the citizenry of Vietnam. The last thing some Vietnamese farmer out in the rice paddies in some isolated village in Vietnam needed. We provided television for them and uh, the armed forces. We broadcast television live from the air in, in the C-121 aircraft that we're flying. So anyway, in uh, October 65, I left the Texas River and uh, we did the island hop, you know, uh, San Francisco to Hawaii to uh, Wake. Guam, the Philippines, and into a, a Saigon, where we did uh, about every other day a trip back and forth from the Philippines to Saigon, resupplying that outfit. And that went, that went on until uh, I think late November of uh, '65. We came back to the U.S. for uh, all of December and part of January before I flew back to Saigon permanently. Well, I mean, permanently, meaning that I stayed there until June of 66. Oh, Philippines. We did, uh, we were staying at uh, Sangley Point Air Base, which is in Cavite, a town across Manila, Manila Bay from Manila. We could take the ferry boat across Manila Harbor to Manila. But uh, the most interesting thing in the two months I stayed there was we, we uh, signed up for a tour of Paxahanian Falls, a uh, dugout canoe trip up this river, which is kind of famous among Filipino people. Jesse knows about it. And we spent the day paddling up this uh, the only this was a white water, uh, white water small river, about the size of the Lackawanna. And we, then we got to the top, there was a fall. And we turned around and did the mad dash back to the base camp, which was a, uh, a Filipino restaurant. But it wasn't like a, in a town, it was out in the boonies. And we had ourselves a, a good Filipino lunch there. We, I think it was near that, that area where those natives were discovered about 10 years later. The Aboriginal Filipino the natives made the headlines in all the papers. I think it was eventually uncovered to be a fake. Uh, that, that was the interesting part of that trip. And then we'll skip on until my 1966 six months here, friends with this army captain. And uh, he had to go up country to some, some remote spot in the, in the central highlands in Vietnam. But he had no, uh, no personal sidearm. And I had a, a 38 revolver with a shoulder holster. And he, uh, he said he needed the 38 for his own protection. Why well, he wanted to know if he could borrow for two weeks. He said, in return, I could have his Jeep. So uh, for the next two weeks, I had my own personal Jeep. Drove around Saigon, free gas, free service. Not a bad deal. So I, and I learned how to drive in that crazy ass traffic in Vietnam. Which was good because uh, after I got rid of the Jeep, a bunch of us were sitting around and decided we needed motorcycles. It would be a perfect complement to our lifestyle in Vietnam. So uh, we thought that going to Hong Kong would be a good place to buy motorcycles because there wasn't any available for sale on the open market in Saigon. So the next day we took one of our cargo planes and it flew up to uh, Hong Kong, about a three-hour flight. And uh, 
stayed overnight in a hotel in downtown in Hong Kong. The next morning we went to the Honda dealer and arranged for them to drive 10 small Honda motorcycles out to the airport. We paid cash, loaded the, the Hondas onto our airplane and flew them back to Saigon. And so 10 of us wound up with uh, Honda motorcycles. But then I had to get a, a Vietnamese driver's license. In order to get a driver's license, you had to have a Vietnamese insurance policy. So I hired a guy, Sandwich Service, to take me through all of the bureaucratic paper, paperwork to get a Vietnamese driver's license, which I still have somewhere in my memento stack. But I don't have the insurance policy. So I got this uh, motorcycle and I spent the next two or three months driving around Saigon with my own motorcycle. Well, ten of us did. When I left, I sold this motorcycle to an Air Force officer. And uh, about three years ago, uh, one of the Meals on Wheels volunteers on Christmas Day a guy that came with his wife and for some reason we got talking about our past and he had been an officer in, uh, in the army in Saigon in 68, like two years after I was, and commented that he had a motorcycle in Saigon, a red Honda that he bought from somebody, you know, an officer who had bought it from somebody else. So it must have been the same motorcycle that I sold when I left in uh, June of 66. It's probably still there because they never throw anything out in those countries. So that was incident number two of interest. Number three, oh, was the suicide bombing in Saigon at the American Hotel. About four blocks from my place. The blast, well, I heard the gunfire first. They must have spotted the uh, the, the truck driving towards the hotel. I uh, opened my window in the hotel and stuck my head out the window just at the time the blast went off. That uh, scared the hell out of me. So that's not to be said about that. And the last thing I have to say about uh, Saigon, the meaningless war, was the day I left. We uh, we had a chartered flight, all soldiers getting back to uh, Travis Air Force Base in San Francisco. So we left Sotsuma <coughs> Air Base, Saigon, hot, smelly, tropical city, noisy helicopters all over the place, just taking off and landing. And we wanted to walk up, uh, no jetway, we used to walk up a ladder way to get into the plane right from the, uh, the air, or from the taxiway. But it was just, here we were in war-torn Saigon, and it said smelly, hot, sweaty, onto the airplane, the airplane flew us uh, a couple of stops back to Travis Air Force Base. We landed in the middle of the night. I think I was the only one for outfit going back that, that day. And so this was the middle of the night. I was walking through the, uh, the passenger terminal at Travis Air Force Base, just walking off to my, my nervous energy. And there was nobody else around. I was way down the end of some corridor. And I saw a, a man in a uniform sitting on a, a bench all by himself. He was in a Navy, off, uh, Navy uh, khaki uniform. And I, as I walked up, I could see that he had a a bunch of ribbons and a Navy pilot's wings. As I got close to him, his face was totally burned off. There was two holes for his nose, his ears gone, and the scar tissue all over what I guess you would call his face. He was sitting there alone in the terminal, obviously so self-conscious that he want to, didn't want to mix with people. And I was, I got gas when I got to see him. My jaw dropped, but I didn't want to show it because I didn't want to make him feel any worse than he was. So I sat there and talked to him for a while. 
and an hour started to get sick to my stomach. So I made my pleasant goodbyes and left. What a horrible thing for a guy. I mean, his face was disfigured beyond any possibility of repair. They were evidently returning home after being severely wounded and somewhat patched up. I always remember that. Or so I got it, we took it, I took us by bus to San Francisco International Airport for a flight back to Dulles. Well, I got on a commercial flight in my civilian clothes by then and landed at Dulles Airport. And uh, if you've ever landed at Dulles, you're going to pick you up in these crazy ass buses on stilts way off away from the terminal and drive you back to their jetway and, and you get on to the, the uh, into the terminal. So I go to this air-conditioned, Muzak plane, civilian clothes, dress population. And I had just 24 hours before I left, as I said, the bug-infested, rotten, fish-smelling, noisy, loud, hot Saigon, and 24 hours later I was like down some kind of a magical tube into this air-conditioned music plane, civilian Columbus dressed, Dulles International Airport. It was just, my brain couldn't deal with it. What a shock, what a cultural shock that was. From, from the, the war zone to La La Land in 24 hours. Is that TSS, TSN? On Smith Airways to, uh, I didn't, you know, that was a, uh, wouldn't be in my log book because no. I didn't, I was part of the crew. <clears throat> so that's, that kind of. didn't you get married then? And got married two weeks later. I still don't think I adjusted my trip back and uh, the contrast between Vietnam and the real world. And nobody cared. You just get off the plane. It's plain clothes, and everybody's talking about their private lives and the, you know life has been going on in the good old USA. Certainly different from those six months I spent in Saigon, when everything was the same seven days a week. Too much of a contrast. I got married two weeks later. It seemed like I just walked off, walked off of the airfield and. Vietnam and walked down the altar of the church. My brain is still trying to adjust to that one.